Dance Free Friday webinars. I'm your hostess, Shelly Sanchez Terrell. And uh, we are here every Friday, thanks to AmericanTiesel.com. You can um, definitely check out our certifications, which we teach classes um, in different cities and countries, so you can get your certification. And then we also teach online. Um, we have uh, teaching with technology certification, a certification for teaching young learners, for teaching advanced TESOL, and also teaching business English. You can check out americantiesel.com slash blogger, and that's where we post a lot of our webinar um, updates, um, the resources, and um, you'll also find tons and tons of um, series where we feature books uh, for language learners and teachers. Uh, we also feature um, different types of um, apps and technology of the month. Those are some of our new series, so you can check out a lot of that. Um, on the American Tiesel blog. Today we're going to talk about outdoor learning because around the corner is summer in some countries. I know it's just the start of winter in some other countries, but um, in those countries it's usually a really good, um, it, it's really great to go outdoors as well. So if you're able to go outdoors and you are teaching um, in some of the few months, then you can take your students outside for a few um uh, for a few lessons uh, that really refreshes the mind that really gets them excited and it, it's a great way to change the environment without really um, having to spend any money or having to um, or having to really do much to your classroom or anything drastic um, so even something like getting your students to have a class discussion outside or just uh, read outside um, is all a, a wonderful way to really get them engaged. Some people um, in, will teach uh, courses that are not required. So, for example, or they are, but that students don't necessarily want to attend. Um, there's a lot of low motivation at this time because some students just want to be outside and they want to be playing. And so this happens when you're teaching, for example, summer school or if you're teaching um, if you're teaching English um, and, and students are forced to go to like an English summer camp or any kind of camp like that, then a lot of times their motivation is very low. Um, and I know that's something that I've experienced before too. So having some way for them to really have um, outdoor adventures and learn a lot is really a great way to, um, to make it to where they'll actually um, participate and, and they'll actually um, learn a lot more. It's a great way to also introduce play inside your uh, curriculum um, and play is for all ages. It's not only for very very young children. Often we think of play for very young children but um, there's a lot of ways that adolescents and teenagers can go outside as well and do a lot of um, learning through play. So here are a few ideas um, that you've probably seen in a few other webinars, but hopefully I can introduce you to some new web tools that maybe you haven't seen and some new ideas or refresh some new ideas. Um, and I think that that's, um, so Peggy George mentioned something really important inside the conversation that it sometimes, in some places it gets really warm and we do have a lot of warm places here. Um, represented today. We have uh, Greece and Brazil and Italy and Phoenix, Arizona. And so all of these places can get very, very, very hot. Um, and so there are precautions you have to take. When your students do go outside, make sure that they either have, you know, um, hats. Um, I know especially in places like Australia, that's really important in certain areas um, where there's, uh, you know, they can get um, a, a lot of exposure to the sun can make them really, really sick. Um, also, you can have, for example, um, students make sure that they have their sunscreen on as well. So sunscreen, anything to protect them from the sun. Make sure they wear light clothes so they don't get dehydrated. Make sure there's water um, is all really important when students do go outside to play. So one of the ways that your students can do a lot of learning is through field observations. And, and that's a great way for students in general to learn um, and also to be 
um, uh, to also learn science, they can learn CLIL, uh, content language integrated learning, they can learn about the environments, they can learn about bugs, they can learn about rocks, they can learn about plants. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that they can um, discover, you know, the environment um, and ecosystems around them uh, just through going outside. You sh if you, they have a mobile device, it's even, it's one of the best ways to actually for them to be able to do field observations. They can act like scientists because a lot of scientists now um, use mobile devices and or different types of mobile devices where they can take pictures, they can um, and do drawings, like for example, if they have an, um, a tablet of some kind or like an iPad or uh, an Android tablet or something, then they, they're able to draw and then they're able to uh, label and um, also observe. And they can also um, take notes and, and they can also um, notate their photos. They can draw arrows. So there's a lot of different ways that they can do this. They can do this with regular apps such as uh, Be Funky. They can do this with, um, that allows drawing. They can do things with like Evernote. Evernote allows drawing. Um, so there's a lot of different apps made just for that. Or they don't even have to have an app. They can just do this, take the pictures, and then create a presentation together and present these findings to other peers. They can even work in pairs and do this if you're short on devices. Um, there's a few apps that actually help with this. Currently in the book that I'm writing, uh, Hack Learning, the 10 Ed Tech Missions, I talk about um, a new role that um, our students play, which is called citizen scientists. And as citizen scientists, uh, what uh, people around the world are able to do is able to use an app, and they help organizations um, such as MIT. MIT has set up a lot of these different apps where people actually um, will enter data, enter images, they'll take photos, they'll add their geolocation, um, that they'll 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 actually fill out entries that talk about um, the birds, the plants, the trees, the animals, all of these things that surround them. Um, recently, I, t I I shared one of the projects which was from um, which was about trees. They started a new international database of trees. So what this does is it adds to a larger database that anyone can look at and then if they're in, you know, wandering and hiking or anything like this, then they're able to use these apps and they're able to search and, and see what it is that they um, are looking at. You know, for example, if you're with any children, they think, wow, you know, the, 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 this is a really interesting bird. I wonder what it is. Then they can just search um, where they're at and they can see what others have contributed to this database. So it's not run necessarily by, um, by, by scientists on here, but it's actually run by um, people. People add to this, so they call them citizen scientists. They do the, um, the field work. There's another one called Zydeco. Um, that one's only iOS. The great thing about Project NOAA is that it's um, iOS and it is Android as well. So um, that's really great. Um, Zydeco is a great app as well. It does it a little bit uh, different. Um, the thing I like about Project NOAA is that you also get access to different um, encyclopedias within there. So you can get more information if you want to make a better data entry. Um, here on Zydeco, they actually um, walk through the steps like a scientist. So um, they put in, your students put in different animals. Um, they take pictures here. Here they have one from Costa Rica. Um, here's an, one that's a cave. Um, and they go through the actual parts. They have a claim. They, um, they have to, they go through um, like a science experiment, a claim. Evidence, evidence, which is a picture, a photo, and then their reasoning, and then they they continue and they um, uh, write all of these down. So that way they think like a scientist while they're hiking or while they're on a field trip or while they're investigating a national park. Um, the one that I really love a lot 
if you're working with young learners is bio kids. So this one is set up to make it more interesting and engaging and at the level for children. So right away, children are um, asked to take a picture because that's what's really exciting and interesting for them. Um, and notice that the pictures don't have to be great. Um, they can just be a close-up shot or, you know, you do have to watch out. Some kids might be allergic. So you don't want them to get too close. You might have them just do the zoom in feature. And then they identify um, what do you sense? Is it a plant, an animal, a track, or other sign? So that, and then they're walked through the process of doing this. So I think Wild Kids is a really great way to get students to be able to take that nature walk, uh, which is something that I do a lot during. Um, uh, with all students of all ages, that's one learning that we do, is we do nature walks. And while they're walking, it used to be when we didn't have technology that the students would take plastic bags and then collect um, the different, you know, samples. But now we can actually preserve the environment and we don't have to take away from the environment. They don't have to press flowers or anything. They can actually let them live. And um, they can just take the pictures and they can add information through cool apps like this. These apps do work without an internet connection. Um, you can fill them out and then once you are connected to the internet, that data will be stored. So you once they are downloaded and you do need the internet to download them, then when it goes up, then it can be filled again. Another great way to learn, and even adolescents and teens, um, I find like this as well. If you don't have any technology, not all learning has to be with technology these days. Um, and you do have to get permission from the school grounds, but uh, chalk, chalk is a great way. That, and they've had made so many advanced, um, there's so many advanced ways uh, or advanced shock that you can actually um, purchase these days. The, you know, they have some that go in the dark. They just have so much... Uh, fun colored chalk um, and there's a lot of artists um, that actually work with chalk now um, and do graffiti artists and stuff that will actually do things on um, sidewalks and things like that too. The great thing about it as Peggy George mentioned is it's easy to wash off as well. For this kind of work you might want to get students um, and even in the summer if you run a summer program something that we used to do is um, you're bound to get a little messy so if you're doing any kind of artwork and or you know working with clay or dirt or uh, dyes or anything um, outdoors, you may want to get your students to have aprons. So that's something that we do in a lot of the um, elementary schools I've worked with as well. Um, we've had students have their own apron that they've designed at the beginning, or their own T-shirts, big T-shirts, so that way they can put that over their clothes and they don't get dirty. Um, and it's great for you as well as a teacher. So if you have fancy or nice clothes, um, then there you can always have something that you put on um, and that you don't ruin those nice clothes as well. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of ways to learn. You can learn math, of course, and then hand-eye coordination. And um, it's just fun in general by playing hopscotch. Um, you can do vocabulary challenges where one st where you pair students, they work in pairs, and uh, one student draws something and the other guesses what they're drawing. Um, so it could be part of a vocabulary, some kind of vocabulary they've learned in the classroom. It's a great way to review vocabulary. Um, and then they just switch off. Once one gets it, then the other one switches off. Um, they could do one of my favorite games, which is win, lose, or draw, or like Pictionary. So students can actually, um, you can give them little flashcards or something, and then they draw from the flashcard, and then they draw what it is, and then the other students try to guess what it is, too. Um, and then you can do um, positive, students can write positive messages around the school grounds. You'll have to get permission for that, but that can be a great way to really enhance the school culture and really get um, people around the school building to, to just be excited and happy um, by finding inspirational messages that students have decided on. Um, they can also take pictures of those and add them to a social media campaign. They can have a hashtag and then just add those and encourage um, 
and have inspirational messages. Um, and they can also have draw relays for one, um, you know, you have them draw uh, something and then they, they have to go, they, you can have two lines line up, you know, one gets a shock, they have to draw it. And then once you okay the vocabulary word that they drew, then they can um, go back. You can have them do a class or small group story where the first student draws something. Um, the next student, um, it's sort of like charades, but with drawing. They add to the scene, and then they make up part of that story um, to go along with what they've drawn. So there's a lot of ways to have fun with shop. There's also playground mathematics. Um, students make different predictions as far as, um, so it depends what kind of equipment you have on your in your playground. So for example, if they're swinging, um, you can uh, determine, for example, um, students can make predictions. They can, uh, for example, write, okay, if I push her in, you know, if I, I push the person in the back, in the center of the back, then I believe they're going to go this amount of distance. So they predict depending on what they do. Or, for example, they could do it without pushing someone. They could actually have the swing. And they can decide, okay, if we raise the swing up this angle, then we think that it's going to go this far, okay? Um, they could do things like, for example, um, the speed at which someone will slide down. And they can make predictions um, based on the weather, their clothes. So there's a lot of ways that they can um, learn math in the playground. They can then, um, after, or they can just do measurements. They can measure, you, you know, um, the different angles on how playgrounds are made, you know, how certain swings and slides are made. They can measure shadows, so they can measure their own shadows at different times of the day, and they can see how the sun works and shadows in general, and how the shadows, um, where they are within the day, and also they can measure, for example, um, the length and in, in, in how stretched out they are according to the height of the person as well. And you can actually Google that online and you can find actual lesson plans that talk about measuring shadows. Um, you can also do experiments uh, with kites, paper airplanes, and rockets. Students can build uh, work in small groups or even pairs and they can have um, you know, they can build a kite a certain way, each one of them with different materials, and then they can see which uh, kite uh, flies the furthest um, and make different predictions as well. And then they can make adjustments to try and get their paper airplane or kite or even um, rocket, paper rocket, to, to go much further distance or perform better. So there's a lot of ways that they can... Um, they can experiment and then they can see what happens and then go back and make adjustments, um, try to read up and, and learn the science behind it and then see if they can actually make their um, objects do much better. And that's one of the great things about um, experimentation and play in general is that students get to do the experiment and we let them keep at it. So if for the day, you know, that might take a couple of days, but, you know, for one day that they'll read up and then they'll design, they'll, they'll plan um, their kites. Um, the second day they'll, they'll actually build the kites um, and then they'll, maybe the third day, you know, and at that date they can fly them or the next day they can fly them. And then the day after, you know, they can, they can see what happened and then they can make predictions. And, um, I mean, they can, they can decide, you know, what might make it do a little bit better, so, and then they can go back and they can make the adjustments or redesign their kites and then see if that works, if it actually does better. And I think that's the important part. Instead of just having them where each you know group competes against each other and see which flies the longest or a highest distance, they can actually go back and improve their kite and see who um, does the best in improving um, their paper airplane or kite. They can do outdoor board game challenges. So there's a lot of ways that um, there's a lot of board games you can play outside. There's huge ones as well, but you can usually find like a, a large chess or checkered set 
um, that students can play that is human size now. You can even do like human size bowling ball. I mean, there's so much that is as huge. Um, and then there's of course outdoor games as well, where you can just take a bunch of board games outside, have them at the picnic tables and have the students just play. Um, and they learn a lot with those games. Boggles World is a great, if you don't have a bunch of board games and don't have a budget for that, then you might want to look at um, Boggles World because Boggles World has a bunch of uh, game templates, board game templates that your students can print out um, and then they can make their own games as well. Sorry. Students can also play sports. They can host a field day or an Olympics game day. They can learn sports from different countries. Uh, one of the sports in um, Germany, when I was teaching in Germany, that we learned about was curling. And so we were able to watch this video on YouTube about curling from the Olympics. And then what we did was we, um, you know, got the materials and, and uh, played curling as well. So there's a lot of, uh, we learned, you know, read about it, you know, the history of it, the tradition, why it's in that country. And. Those are things that your students can learn, and then they get to have hands-on play doing it. Um, if it's a popular sports season, then that's something that they can do, is they can talk about their favorite players, and then they can play that sport. Um, here, of course, we're featuring football or soccer, um, as it's sometimes called as well. <laughs> Um, your students can also um, invent their own game. Uh, that's something that they can do as well. Geocaching. Um, students, so this is um, where you use math and uh, science as well to find little treasures which are everywhere around the world. So um, you can go to geocaching.com. There's also free apps for um, any of your mobile devices. Um, and what you do is that people all over the world have sh um, hidden these little treasures. And so w you can find either big boxes or you can find really tiny um, little containers. It just depends on the geocache. So students are given the, um, the longitude and latitude. They're given the GPS location of the treasure. And they have to look around to try and find that treasure. I think it's easier if you use a compass. Um, that's usually, it works out a lot better than just using your phone, but you can use your phone as well. The apps have um, different clues written in, so you do read clues from other people. You can read their comments. That's how I find a lot of my geocaches, is that we actually look at the comments, we look at the uh, clues, and um, we also use the longitude and latitude to try and find it. And this is what the geocaching uh, location looks like. Um, you can, your students don't have to register. You can register. It's for free and uh, be able to put your city, country, location. Um, and then you'll see the geocaches that are within a uh, short distance from your school. Sometimes you can even, um, once you're registered, you can actually uh, do where you yourself will um, add geocaches. You can create your own that's around the school. And then people can come and they can, they can look at those geocaches. Students can, after they do the field observations or um, they go on their nature hikes, they can actually create their own digital uh, books and scrapbooks and posters. They can be, it could be a nature book that, that talks and shows pictures and um, has articles about the nature um, that surrounds them in the school um, or at the learning institution, a rock collection, what kind of rocks are around the area. And they can even collect these from their home, so the things that are around their household as well. Um, bugs um, as well, they can take pictures. Uh, Christina says <laughs> to keep away, yes, exactly. So they can take pictures that are zoomed in, they don't have to go. Um, near the bug, <laughs> so that's good. It's good to have also as well where students, um, if they're allergic, um, to make sure that they heed any precautions in case they are allergic to any bugs or plants or anything. Uh, bird identification or plants and trees as well. 
Um, some great tools for that. I've mentioned in the past, I do Buncee, I do Glockster, Canva, Book Creator, and Byte Slides are all great tools to do this. Even S'more could be uh, good, but these are better for digital scrapbooks and uh, digital presentations and posters. QR codes are a great way to learn outside or in and out of the classroom and have hands-on uh, learning. You can find, actually, I think a, a lot of um, different activities. I've done a, another webinar on this, and I think it's uh, here, QR, ShellyTerrell.com slash QR. I didn't write that down, but I should have. You can create interesting QR codes with visually doing a tag and QR stuff. Um, those are uh, free web tools and apps to download on any of your devices. You can create scavenger hunts with QR codes. It's a great way to get students thinking, reading clues, and also using their um, thinking and problem-solving skills to try and find um, the next clue. So a great way to set this up is through Kick a Clue. That's a good app for that, the Goose Chase app or qrwild.com that's where you set it up with different qr codes and so if you use those you can design it and then students can go and they can just um they need a mobile device that actually is um where they can scan the qr code and they can work in groups if you want or uh, pairs so that way they're able to scan it sometimes i'll just have them use my qr scanner and one of my devices and then they can take turns using that to um, do the scavenger hunt. You can have them instead do um, photo or video challenges. And uh, recently on my blog, I put um, over 50 um, different on my blog. You'll find them 50 tools and web apps to, in, um, to conduct photo and video challenges. So you can find that on my blog right now. Um, and this is what it looks like. So you can do different learning missions. Um, here's an example mission, snap a photo of, <coughs> sorry about that, graffiti. You consider art, and then they can get some sort of points for that, or they can get a digital badge for that. You can give them um, different tools that they can use, one of the apps or web tools if you want. And then they post it on a blog, or if you have a class at Modo or Schoology or Google Classroom, they can snap it on there too to show that they've completed the mission. And then um, they they write something about it. So not only do they take a photo of the learning around them, but they're also writing. Um, they're um, pairing it up with some kind of writing. And no, this is actually one from the past. So <laughs> But they can do that. <laughs> um, I'm taking a break from teaching um, this semester and the summer uh, to, to, to be with Savvy. So maybe in the fall when I go back to teaching again, <laughs> they can do that again, my students. <laughs> um, there's I Spy um, as well as another game I've had uh, different groups of learners play. So what they do is um, they take a zoomed in shot about, a, you know, an object or represent something. And then um, people try to guess what they are, what the picture is. Peers try to guess. And then um, they zoom out and then they show what the whole picture really was. So it could be an object from home. It could be a great way to look um, outside the class in you know, uh, trees, they could do it of trees or plants, or they can do it of different types of shapes. Um, usually I associate it with this image. Um, it's, um, or show them different types of geometric shapes, and then they have to take a picture of an object that um, represents one of these shapes. And then I've had in a lot of occasions where I've actually been using classrooms that have document cameras. At my university, we have document cameras, um, so we can actually put the picture, we put the phone and zoom. It, it shows it on a projector, on the document camera, the projector. Um, and sometimes if you have it connected to like an Apple TV or an interactive whiteboard, it's a great way to show that shot and then get the class to um, guess what the shape is. 
Poplet is a great outdoor app because you can take pictures outside. So if you have the Poplet app on your mobile device, um, you can take your own pictures from outdoors and add it to this mind map. So you can create a mind map of the pictures you take outside. So when students are investigating bugs or plants or rocks or um, maybe different types of weather phenomenon, maybe they're doing, uh, for example, observing um, clouds, maybe they take different pictures of the clouds and then they label them and discover what kind of clouds they are. That can all be great for a mind map um, or things about the weather. There's so much that they can do outside um, and Poplet is a great way to take pictures. They can even take pictures of the building. Uh, different parts of the building and, and talk about architecture as well. Um, jump roping, and there's a whole webinar on jump roping games as well. Students do learn different vocabulary with jump roping chants, um, or they can do hand clapping chants as well. And that was a recent webinar that we have, I think we did within the last year. And then, of course, there's traditional outdoor games that really teach uh, students how to work together as a class, um, how to have um, um, a sportsmanship, develop sportsmanship. Um, and so you can monitor these games or even work together. There's things like hide and seek or tag, which also develop uh, social skills as well. So any of those traditional outdoor games that you played when you were little, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, um, any kind of those games that you play are really great for students still, you know, just to give them a break, get them to run around, get them to work together. Um, and, you know, there's just a lot of great um, games that they can play that you played when you were younger. And it could give them a break from technology. So if you have them in all day and they're on computers or you know, they're learning with technology. It's good to have them go outside and, and do things, even without technology. As I noted before, it's important that students are dressed properly. It's important that we also carry, if you're going to be there for a long set of time outside, you're going to take, for example, field trip or something, it's good to have um, water, snacks, anything like that, if you're going for a long period of time. Or to have this very, very nearby and, and know um, one of the students can be charged of it or carry it outside, um, or a student aide, um, for example, or your aide could do this as well, or you can carry this as well. There's a lot of um, different first aid kits. They're really inexpensive. Um, and I know because I've bought, I've had to buy a few for the baby. So <laughs> um, they're not very expensive. You order them on Amazon. There, there are some that are not um, that are pretty cheap. Um, they also um, have different types of things in case students get scratches, they get hurt, or anything like that. Um, Peggy George makes an important note that some teachers aren't allowed to bring first aid kits on field trips unless they are prepared by a nurse. So um, make sure to check that out on your school. I know also as well that during the summer, a lot of times um, teachers are required to have um, different types of uh, certifications and safety, like uh, CPR certification. So you might want to check that as well to make sure that that's updated if you are teaching in the summer. And you can find more and more ideas if you go to shellyterrell.com slash playground. So I hope you and your students have a wonderful and great time um, in the classroom. Uh, and outdoors, outside of the classroom at some point, even if it's not this summer. So thank you so much for coming. And uh, I hope that you have a wonderful weekend and get to enjoy some time outdoors as well, because these are some great family games too.